Uh, what I thought would be helpful is to talk a little bit more about the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium and how that group uh, develops guidelines. Um, the, uh, I think you've heard CPIC referenced in nearly all of our ECHO sessions. Uh, uh, Natasha gave an introduction of, of CPIC and PGRN and where to find some of that information early on in, the, in one of the earlier ECHOs. And so um, I think since we talk about it so much, it'd be helpful to, to dig into this a little bit more. And I've had an opportunity to be a part of a few different guidelines. So I have um, some insights in how this has evolved over time, at least for the uh, materials that, um, that I've been involved with. Uh, so what, what I'll do in just a, this, this brief um, session is talk about the uh, uh, CPIC. Uh, describe um, and make you aware of, of currently available guidelines and talk a little bit about evidence grading and how uh, drugs are selected for guideline evaluation, because that's a question that comes up every once in a while. And then uh, a bit about the guideline uh, and evidence review process, and maybe um, that will open up an opportunity for a question or two. And I think that will be sufficient to maybe take a next step into awareness of what that's all about for those who um, haven't had an opportunity to, 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 to think about CPIC a whole lot. So um, some of these, uh, these back, this background material is available at the CPIC website through their, their resources, um, the resources section. So I wanna acknowledge that. Um, there's some key points about CPIC guidelines that are important to, to, to know about. Um, and, and one, the first one that I'll mention and then I'll reinforce uh, again is that they're based on uh, an assumption that test results are in hand. And so the guidelines don't discuss the merits of doing the test. So even there are pharmacogenetic guidelines, not should you test or not test, it's how do you use the information and what information merits uh, some sort of clinical action. One of the nice things is that they're in standardized format, so everything in each guideline is organized very similarly, so it, it allows you to kind of know how things are formatted, where to find the information. So after you read one, it makes it easier to do that for, for other guidelines. Um, there's a, a, a structured and um, uh, anchored approach to the grading of the evidence and the recommendations that may result from that. The guidelines that are developed and published all go through peer review. Uh, they are have all been published in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics, which tends to be the, the home for those. Uh, their, the plan is for them to be updated at a, a reasonable frequency, and I'll talk about that um, I'll talk a little about that a little bit later. And they also have a fairly um, uh, uh, involved authorship policy that involves um, uh, submitting some information for review, also with respect to evaluating conflict of interest because they want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, so again, I want to re reiterate that when you hear about CPIC guidelines, or these pharmacogenetic guidelines, it's how to use the information, not whether or what, not whether you should get a test. Uh, there are a number of different tests. They include different pieces of information. The CPIC guidelines to date have evaluated uh, evidence in the context of drug gene pairs. Um, and so there are a lot of tests that are available that will give you uh, gene-specific information, but they may also give you um, combinatorial matrices, and that's not in the scope of what CPIC has addressed so far. Um, one of the reasons for that is that there are maybe some evolving related factors that may play into the should you get a test or should you not. Um, but uh, from the availability of information, costs of genetic uh, testing has been going down. Uh, as time moves on, more people will have information on hand, uh, whether or not it was ordered for a specific purpose or not. And so having knowledge about what to do with that information is, is going to be increasingly important. And that's something that we've, uh, we've observed uh, uh, here as well. Uh, this, so the, the last time they updated this slide was in 2021, so there may be, I think there's a few more guidelines that have come out in the last year, but this was as of 2021. Uh, there was, uh, there's over 26 guidelines, uh, updates, and 22 genes, and over, closing in on 70 different uh, drugs, actually that'll be, 
as of this fall, it'll be it'll clear 70 by quite a bit, I think, uh, given the update that we're, we've been working on. And I think there's a couple of patterns that, that are helpful to take away from this particular page. Um, the, the guidelines began uh, being published in, in 2011, um, and they've been ongoing. And you can see that they, they cover a number of different drugs and genes that go through, um, they cover different therapeutic areas and drug categories, uh, oncology, pain, mental health, neurology, infectious disease. So this is really, um, uh, this umbrella is really capturing a wide variety of, of drugs and genes. The original intent was to have um, updates done at perhaps a more frequent on a more frequent basis. Uh, so I think if you see here, let's look at 2015. That's when SSRIs were first published, and and we're in the still in the process of doing an update for that now. So I think. While it's desirable to maybe have them done at increased frequency, the, the time it takes to do these uh, and the number of people it does it, to, that needs to be involved uh, is, has been a, proved to be a limiting factor for doing this at a, perhaps a more frequent basis. Uh, this is just looking at this again, uh, maybe in a little bit different way, highlighting the variability in genes. Uh, and I think uh, for those of you who have, have uh, looked at these genes before, um, I think you would, what, I guess one of the takeaways here is that they generally represent, um, uh, started with pharmacokinetic related genes, and there's been an increase in expansion to more pharmacodynamic related genes, which have uh, some unique complexities. And we can talk about that if anybody has questions about it. But uh, they do cover a number of different pathways relevant to different uh, therapeutic drug classes. Uh, so there's over 400 members. This started as a US-based uh, effort, and it has been uh, historically funded. At least the organizing site has been funded by the NIH, but it's involved to be uh, international with uh, representation from uh, over 35 countries. And. Um, also, the FDA and the NIH and some professional societies are, are uh, observers so that uh, there, there's at least a, an attempt to have some an inclusion of additional stakeholders in the loop so that there's awareness of what, uh, what groups are doing as they may be uh, relevant to, um, uh, to them as, as they're evolving their activities and vice versa. So one of the, um, you know, one question that, that commonly comes up when I've when I've talked about this is how how is a, how is a drug or a drug class selected for uh, the guideline evaluation process? Uh, they have a decision tree that's published on their website here, and it it gets a little um, I don't know long winded to talk through all the the, the branches on this tree. So I'll I'll try to summarize it uh, based on. Uh, and how I've seen things evolve over time and, and a bit of my experience. When they first started, they, they wanted to select the drug gene pairs that, um, that I guess we could call them low-hanging fruit. Those would really establish evidence suggesting that, you know, there's probably some uh, good clinical uh, recommendations that could be made if you know uh, genotype information. And, um, and so sort of after that first round, um, the way that it has evolved now is that uh, drug gene pairs uh, are submitted to the to, to the CPIC and their steering committee through um, like a guideline proposal or uh, a recommendation. And then, um, and so these are based on, uh, you know, stakeholders of, of CPIC, stakeholder CPIC members, members of the steering committee, who have knowledge of a different therapeutic area and have a sense that um, uh, different drugs and genes may be clinically useful. And then there's a process of determining what, which guidelines should be selected next because they can't take everything on all at the same time. So one of the a couple of the features that they use to determine what should be evaluated and what, what might come next um, or require more effort First of all, if a, if a gene is already in, involved in an existing guideline, it, it makes an, a subsequent evaluation in relation to another drug a lot easier so that you don't have to 
uh, have to discuss a new genotype to phenotype translation scheme and those types of things which get a little bit uh, uh, tricky and can take up a lot of time. Uh, the, the second parts are um, whether there's, there's preliminary uh, information either from the FDA or other guideline related groups like the Dutch Pharmacogenetic Group is one that's an international entity that, that has some uh, guidelines. And so if a, a, a drug gene pair is, is addressed elsewhere, um, it's, it's viewed as important for CPIC to, to also weigh in on that. And, and then also there are some levels of evidence that exist in the pharmacogenetics knowledge base. And I, I'll talk about that in a couple of slides, which are essentially a, a, a provisional evaluation of the literature in, in re, as it may or may not support um, uh, different drugs and genes. And so if, if there's pretty good sense that there might be something actionable, then that will make it a higher priority. So my, my experience doing this is I, I've submitted a, a nomination for a drug gene pair related to antipsychotic medications in relation to CYP2D6. And so when we did that, we had a, we, we submitted a, um, an application to the, the consortium. It was reviewed by the steering committee. We got invited to present at one of the meetings and then uh, while other groups have done that for other drugs and genes, such as antihypertensives, they then send out a periodic um, uh, survey to get a sense from the, the membership as to what, um, what the group feels may be uh, good to do next. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly talk about um, evidence grading and, and, and guidelines. Uh, sometimes this can be on the surface, it sounds may sound straightforward, but it's it does get a little bit tricky, and there's some nuanced differences that I just wanted to make you aware of. So I think we'll do this, and then we'll we'll make a transition to the the, the case discussion and and an update. Um, there are you'll you'll see reference to CPIC and Farm GKB evidence gradings. Uh, these are preliminary assessments of, of available literature supporting the potential cl clinical utility of a drug gene pair. You can get this at the CPIC website, and I'll show you a screenshot on the next slide. There's a CPIC level. Uh, this, is a, this is a combination of the strength and genetic association and the strength of a clinical recommendation that's in a guideline. And then there's the actual guideline itself, which is the, in the in the formal assessment of the quality of that literature and the publication of those um, recommendations, as well as the major finding statements that may support those recommendations. So if you go to the CPIC, uh, if you go to the CPIC website uh, and, and you click on the drugs and genes portal, you can get a search, you, you pull up a search, um, uh, you can pull up a search tab here and you can enter a drug. And so if you can see this, I've entered citalopram here. And what it uh, reveals is a, a spreadsheet with a number of different columns, including whether there's preliminary evidence or guideline evidence for gene, drug, guideline, the CPIC level, CPIC level status, farm GKB level of evidence, also whether it's on the FDA a label and a link to any guideline related publications. So you can put a gene in here, or you can put a drug in here. Uh, it's pretty flexible in that uh, in that regard, and you can export the table if you if you really want to get into all the details with that. So, um, with respect to citalopram, what you can see is that one of the genes here, CYP2C19, has a guideline associated with it, has a CPIC level of A, that the status is final, uh, and that it has a what I'll show you in a, in a bit is a high level of farm GKB level of evidence. There are other places where there'll be pr provisional levels. So you see the CPIC provisional status. So you may get a level in some grading here. Um, so for example, SLC6A4 is the, the serotonin transporter. It has uh, like a provisional, uh, provisional grading, but basically what that means is that it has not gone through a guideline, official guideline review. Uh, the farm GKB level of evidence um, is is similar, but it is a separate process, and so you may see places where you get different, um, a, a little bit of a divergence between those those two areas. But that that's where you can you can that's a good place to identify how that exists. 
The CPIC levels are highlighted here, and these are uh, recommend these are essentially the strength of recommendations based on genotype. And I think the higher level takeaway here is that CPIC levels A and B are the uh, the most actionable, um, meaning that if you have a CPIC level of A that's assigned to uh, a drug gene pair, it means that the genetic information should should be used to change prescribing of that affected drug. B is that it could be used to change the prescribing because the, the relative, um, there's alternatives and, um, and there's uh, less risk with choosing those. Um, so there's a potential for, for good outcome. There's not much of a, there's not as much of a downside with it. Uh, C and D means that either there's uh, weak evidence, unclear evidence, or uh, with the take-home point being prescribing actions are, are not recommended based on that. Now you also may run across farm GKP level definitions for genes and drugs. And I think the one thing that I'll highlight here is that first of all, there are more categories. And so it'd be, it's interest, uh, maybe of interest to lead, read those, those descriptions sometimes. I think the, the, take, the thing that I take away here is that this grading really focuses a lot on the level of evidence for a gene drug association with outcome. And I think the CPIC uh, piece uh, maybe adds a bit more context into what you do with that. So there may be some places where you have high levels of association and direction of that association, but where you could get divergence is in uh, whether, whether and how that can be used to select an alternative drug or adjust your dosing. So um, we've been learning a little bit about that in the context of SSRIs and, and maybe some pharmacodynamic genes and how or if to, to consider those. So then um, uh, as, as evidence gets reviewed for a particular guideline, uh, they, they assign levels of evidence linking genotype to phenotype. So there's a literature search, all the articles that get included for assessment, uh, get graded for quality. Uh, the outcomes are then um, uh, consolidated into major finding statements. And then the evidence relating uh, major finding statements are then uh, graded in how they are supported or not supported by the, the prior literature. So just as an example, in our antidepressant guideline update, we had, um, uh, we, we retrieved uh, nearly 1400 articles uh, and uh, over 250 of which were new and went into updated major finding statements that built on what was in 2015. So it's it's quite a um, it's quite an undertaking to sift through all that literature and make sense of of what that supports and what it doesn't. Um, then uh, the evidence related to major finding statements are assessed and then translated into recommendations based off of the genotype information. So high levels of evidence for a recommendation of making some action means that uh, that the evidence includes uh, consistent results from well-designed studies. Or th these these are the the evidence grading related to the major finding statements. So it's high, moderate, weak uh, uh, level of evidence. And then uh, so that's sort of the source material, and then that gets translated into uh, into recommendations, and then the strength of the recommendations is what comes out into uh, the guideline tables. So there you have strong, moderate, optional, or no recommendation for making some sort of prescribing action based on existing uh, genotype information. So usually strong and moderate, um, uh, strong and moderate means like the data is pretty clear. Optional means either there's some differences of opinion, in the uh, in the guideline group, or there's some uncertain uncertainty, but perhaps enough to to make the the reader aware that uh, that that there may be some basis for considering action based on a particular genotype and and, and medication. So um, I could talk longer about it, but for the sake of time, I think I'd like to to wrap this up. But I just wanted to give this brief. Um, uh, a uh, brief extension of what we've been introduced to before uh, to talk to you a little bit about what the guidelines are, uh, that they have a standardized process for 
um, how the drugs and genes are selected, uh, how they go through a grading process and guideline development. And I really feel like they're a um, useful resource for evidence-based information and can, can be used to support uh, the use of test information when, when you have it. 